So in this video, I want to discuss about two approaches using GraphQL for your backend versus not using GraphQL at all, right? So this is something I talked about in the last video and a few videos before that also. And some of you were interested that, hey, Mehul, why do you not prefer using GraphQL? Like what's specifically wrong with GraphQL? And I want to share a few things in this video in form of like, some code examples and some of our learnings with GraphQL. So before we start with this video, I want to just add a few disclaimers. Number one is that don't take this video as a black and white thing. Of course, my opinion itself for me is black and white, but your context depends a lot. For example, don't just pull out GraphQL completely because I'm saying so. Now, this really depends a lot on what your use case is, what you are doing right now, because if you have a public API, let's say with GraphQL, and you have given the endpoints to other people, it obviously doesn't make any sense to remove GraphQL at all. GraphQL has its use case where it can create definition files for cross language compatibility, right? If you want to have languages, different, different languages, be able to connect with your GraphQL instance, that is very, very easy because GraphQL has adopters in a lot of languages. Second thing is that we use our stack use this TypeScript on the back end very strictly plus TypeScript on the front end also very strictly right so both of these things are sort of a catalyst for even like removing GraphQL from our stack if we are somehow able to replace the GraphQL stack with TypeScript natively right so if you're using any sort of other technology like Python your mileage may vary because I don't have experience with Python in serious environments like how do you build backends with Python you know at a scale where types become really important so make sure you consider your stack carefully and last but not the least of course GraphQL has its use cases I'm not denying that but the fact that I'm just saying that it doesn't has a use case only means that it doesn't has a use case specifically for our case for building CodeDAM and Fermion. So if you look at Fermion as a platform, what we do is the nature of our, our business is that if you want to create a website, a white labeled website for your own platform, right? So if you want to sell courses, if you want to create a coding bootcamp, if you want to teach other people, make money out of it, you need a website and you need to accept payments. You need to have coding labs within your platform. You need to have live classes. So this is our use case, right? And I'll tell you why this doesn't fit the GraphQL thing doesn't fit for our use case because everything in our use case specifically is very straightforward in terms of implementation earlier we used to use GraphQL for this whole stack but then we got rid of it right so let me tell you a few reasons why let's put disclaimers out of the picture and let's start with GraphQL's number one problem the number one biggest problem which I don't think I've ever seen anyone talking about when they talk about GraphQL's cons compared to something like TypeScript is that there is is no concept of discriminated unions and this is obviously wrong so what do i mean by this this is a big thing this is so big that i think it's worth dropping graphql just because of this itself i'll tell you what that means so in a traditional setup what it means is that let's say you have a database over here right so this is your database then you have a back end and then finally you have a front end right imagine you have an api call something like this which is something like get me user data right very basic thing you would forward this to your back end back end will talk to database it will get some data and now let's say if this implementation is graphql and the other implementation which i have let's say is some sort of typescript based trpc or zord enabled thing right so let's take a look at what a graphql based implementation would look like so on the front end, you will write something like query user data. I'm just making up, you know, things right now. So this, the format and everything might be a slightly different thing, but you'll say name, username, profile, photo, you know, and let's say you want to get somebody who's like a paying customer, a pro user, right? So you will have a pro user as another object, and then you will start selecting, right? So you'll have something like, you know, bot at pro plan plan type is recurring membership is email sent i'm just showing you a few things now looking at this you might feel like there is nothing wrong but the biggest problem in this query response how graphql would respond this is that it contains certain states which are impossible so it, this response contains more states than it is possible right so I'll, let me show you how if i write an equivalent response for this in Zord schema level, for example, let's say this is your typical TypeScript response. How this would work is something like this, right? So you'll have a name, 
which is a string. You will have a username, which is a string. You'll have a profile photo URL, which is a string, which is also a URL. By the way, you can also have these things, but GraphQL doesn't natively support a lot of these constructs, right? So you can create them on your own, which will obviously like crash your code on runtime. That is what Zord also does. But Zord comes with a lot of handy things also. Then what you would have is something like this. Is pro user or something like pro user data, right? And then you will have an object which has is pro as false or something like this is pro as true right so i'm not able to like syntax highlight this properly so don't mind the bad indentation and all of that see but the basic idea is that over here if you're defining the schema this would be a string which is like mandatory this wouldn't be a string this could also be a mandatory string but over here first of all this object itself is nullable right because you don't know you know if the user is not pro you will probably want to send null then what you would have is that this is email sent for recurring pro membership membership reminder this itself can have true or false or nullable and i'll tell you what the nullable thing here means true means that you know the email is sent false means that email is not sent and nullable means that this state itself is non-applicable because recurring membership would be false in that case because true and false over here only makes sense if recurring membership itself is true now you can tell you can say that you can you know mehul why a what about like if I do something like this, where I make this itself an object and then you start sending data over here. Is recurring or, you know, is email sent sent true or false, right? Of course, you can do something like this, but then the more you nest and the more specific your schema becomes, the more you should probably go towards REST API because the power of GraphQL in general is that you just directly talk to your database in a way and just extract out values from the front end, right? So front end has access to your schema and it can just pick on what the fields you want and just Get those it becomes very difficult or it becomes very cumbersome when you have data which is conditional in nature right so this is what discriminated union sort of means that in this specific case let's say if we have something like this what we could do potentially is email sent for recurring right so if we have something like this what you could technically say is that over here you have other states and then you have something like is recurring pro recurring membership true and then you have is email sent for recurring as boolean right or you just have a completely different state at all where this is true but this is false and then nothing is here so what this allows you to do what the schema on the right allows you to do is have certain have a state which is don't have a state which is impossible over here you can still write inside your code that if is email sent for recurring you know show user reminder right show user reminder something like this but the problem with this is that you this code branch can also trigger if the membership is not recurring at all right i'm just giving you a very basic example and i i'm telling you that this happens in real code when this type is like nullable and it's boolean it's the worst kind of variable where your variable can have three values true false and nullable right because javascript then completely gives up on this not operator whether you're running in strict mode or whatever so this is one of the biggest thing because a lot a lot of bugs we had on code dam and in fermion not in fermion like we never use graphql on fermion just on code dam some of the biggest bugs were because of graphql's this sort of nature right second thing is that it's just cumbersome in general because let's say if you want to create an endpoint in GraphQL, a new endpoint sort of. What you have to do is something like this where first of all on your back end you create output an output type schema something like this output where you define that name is gonna be string email is gonna be string and if you want this to a custom to accommodate a custom format then you have to create those custom types by yourself so that's a huge headache in itself then once you're done doing all of this then you have to go back to your resolver and you have to code up your resolver which is again straightforward and then you go back to the front end and then you do the same thing again so you write this whole query again and then you get the name email all of that right so in our case with Fermion and GraphQL, what we ended up with CodeDAM and Fermion, what we ended up usually doing was that we'll just create an endpoint and we'll just get all the data from that endpoint more or less in every case. So the number one use case of GraphQL, which is pitch like you can get conditional data, we were not following that at all. So it was pretty useless for us and it just increased a lot of time also to create an API because firstly, you have to create the type on the backend. Then you have to run some sort of script to sync the types from backend to frontend. And then you have to type the whole schema again on the front end itself and then you have to use something like you know apollo client or something to perform that query which again is sort of fine but still this 
And over here, I mean, if you have variables and all, then you have to just write the whole thing again, right? So you have to do like a lot of writing multiple times. And even if like the maximum you can do is like automate a lot of these things. And even if you do that, you still have to write at least twice. The first time is on the back end. The second time is on the front end. And then types can be auto-generated. This is a huge waste of time if you use GraphQL like us, which we were sort of using in a way, like rest basically, that if we needed some more data, we'll probably create a new endpoint. Then another problem, which is there, with GraphQL, which we did not face a lot, but it exists, is the n plus one problems where if n plus one querying database, which happens if you know if you are having a schema, something like let's say a query where you have users, then you have let's say post, then you have title inside that post and so on right so what ends up happening is that you recursively start making so many queries for first user the first query would be to get the users if you are implementing graphql in like the graphql -E way where you know you this is a resolver this is a resolver and then they are recursively calling each other based on what you want of course you can just define this in a single resolver also which we used to do with graphql to be very honest like i said we did not use it how it is supposed to be but when you use it how it's supposed to be it unlocks more problems so you get the first query to get the users and then recursively for every single user because you have to run this specific query your backend makes more queries to get posts of every user right so what graphql internally is doing is that it got all the users first of all and then for every user it's calling this individually right it, it can't call it like one by one because you can also do posts directly for a single user right if you have something like user and posts it should be able to do that so if you have implemented your graphql like this it should work and similarly for users also it should work so it leads to one query for all the users and then n queries for every single user to retrieve their specific data that is what this n plus one or one plus n problem means now there are concepts in graphql also to mitigate that there is a concept known as data loaders in graphql which you can look it up read about it but not to get into complexity a lot it just increases the complexity of your code base a lot and for a use case like i said whenever i look at graphql's complexity and then i look at the setup which we have today for fermi or and code dam it seems like it's so much simpler to understand and so much for us it so much feels like it's our solution right we didn't feel much of performance differences as such sure like if you have your custom api implementation you will have some level of performance benefits but it was not like graphql was terribly slow so there is not that the major differences were for dx and for state locking only state locking as in that we don't want more states to be available on the front end than they are there are supposed to be and that is where zod and trpc and these things really really shine right so so yeah i mean now we don't use graphql at all for our last few months we used to use graphql and our like custom backend implementation for a very long time together but we just ripped it out like a few couple of months back but yeah i hope Hopefully this video helped you understand a few more things about GraphQL. That's all for this one. If you like this, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I will see you in the next video really soon.